I won't make any comment given that it's just the first month of the year, um, so it's hard to talk about trends or any issues, but happy to take any questions. Right, um, Yanni. Yeah, um, I just wanted to check, um, you've made reference to the coastal hazards in stage three, and I, I just wanted to check, um, and I had to put these questions through last, last night in light of the um, supplementary, which we're now going to also discuss today, but um, around the, the future transition and, and recovery. And that was around the district plan review. I just wanted to check, um, A, whether there's any process by which we can change the time frame for submissions for the coastal hazards chapter, given um, the concerns that people have expressed around wanting more time to understand it. Yeah, I'll just... Um, and, and B, where our natural hazards strategy is up to. Um, and then C, um, if we had any information about the current time frame for the district plan review and whether that's going to be extended. So there's three questions. Can, can, I, can I jump in? Because um, I met with uh, uh, Minister for the Environment yesterday um, and raised the issue around the you know, concern that people had around the time frame for submissions. The order in council um, provides uh, not later than 30 working days after the date of the public notice given under Clause 5, make a submission to the hearings panel on the proposal. So um, the 30 days is in the order in council. Uh, and so what I'm going to do today is write to the Minister for the Environment and the Minister for Earthquake Recovery, who were the two ministers uh, responsible for the um, order in council, and, and request that there be an extension of time for the submissions. Now, because it's in the order in council, it, it really has to go to central government. So I can't, we, we, we haven't got the power ourselves as a council because of the not later than 30 working days requirement, but we are definitely writing today to ask for an extension of time. So what I just wanted to clarify though is, um, is it the two ministers that can make a change to the order in council or is there some other process that we need to go? No, no, go they through? have to do it. We, we, right. we don't have control okay. over the order in um, council. But, um, you know, I don't think when, when the order in council was written that, um, I, don't, I don't think that they realised that we would be up against a deadline uh, of, of this nature. I mean, 30 days is not a lot of time to absorb that amount of information. Um, the, I, I don't know if people saw the press editorial this morning, but it was quite helpful, I thought, to set out the issues um, that uh, I think have uh, challenged a, a number of people, particularly in the eastern suburbs. Um, I, I mean, I, 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 I've received one of the letters myself, you know, because I'm in a coastal inundation area, but I was already in a flood management area, and the rules are exactly the same. So. You know, for, for um, so I wasn't expecting, I wasn't not expecting to receive a letter, um, and I think that every single person in the Christchurch boundary, certainly not in Banks Peninsula because they hadn't been previously mapped uh, for the flood management areas, um, they they uh, the, the, the rules are going to be the same for them. The real issue is around coastal erosion. And the big issues around coastal erosion relate to the um, inside um, of the of the well the estuary side of the um, South New Brighton South Shore and a, and a and a chunk of the outside because all of the rest of it is not residential um, on on that spit on the on the further down the coastline and in fact the coastal lines are actually not as um, wide as they were um, under, the, under, under the ECAN coastal um, provisions that existed um, before. So um, we've, we've got some work to do, and, and also what I'm um, getting is the, is the actual wording that's gone on to the limbs, because, uh, and I'm, I'm just waiting to receive that, but the wording that um, was put on the limbs makes it clear that this is going through a process and that these, it's based on a report that is going to be subject to the independent hearings panel making, making um, decisions. So it's not, you know, it's, 
that, it, it, you know, that, that I think people have worked really hard to try and make sure that people um, have got as much information as that they possibly can, but it, it is hugely so, challenging for people. So um, a resolution from us today to support your letter to the ministers, is that...? Helpful? Not necessary. OK. Um, and then the, the wider concern was around the DPR timeframes and whether they're still going to be met, and whether there's any discussion through the I think the, the government is having discussion. They have raised with us whether we would be um, agreeable to the time limit being extended, I think, by another six months. So, And, and I've certainly indicated that we would be interested in that Can time frame being extended. on that? Because that's got a number of implications for us as well. In what way? Uh, cost um, and pr process issues. Well, I mean, in, in terms of the um, process issues, I mean, the decision hasn't been made yet. So, no, that's what um, I'm asking. but we I'm get sure, a I'm sure. Around what, what the proposal is, if, if there is change, um, and then the, this, the final question was around the natural hazards strategy. So, my understanding was we have a draft, and we've talked to stakeholders. No, we, we, we put it on hold, um, but to. Uh, link in with the ECAN strategy, as I understand it. Right. Remember, ECAN came and made a submission on the long-term plan, and um, essentially we asked that that be that be um, joined up with the ECAN right. um, natural hazard strategy for the whole of the region. So, in the section 32 around coastal hazards, it says that that strategy may lead to changes to the district plan. So I guess the question fundamentally is, should we not do that strategy first before we make the changes, rather than cause all this angst and grief before we make the yeah, changes? Yeah, but we can't not do it, Yanni. I mean, I mean that's why I've, I've but mentioned... if we get an extension of a time I, I frame, actually mentioned how useful the editorial was this morning. We don't have a choice about whether we do this or not. We have agreed to do our entire district plan and we're, we're doing it now. The, the ECAN does the external coastal lines. We're doing them for ECAN. ECAN are completely on board with, with this process. They have endorsed this process that we're going through. The natural hazards is all hazards. It isn't just coastal erosion and coastal inundation. I think you're confusing two issues. Of course a natural hazard strategy may lead to changes to the district plan. The last time that we did this, it took five years to get one change to our district plan in order to deal with fl flood management areas. Flood management areas did not come into the Christchurch plan. The current flood management areas did not come in until the 31st of January 2011, because I think the Christchurch City Council thought that September was done and dusted by then. And then there was February. The only point I was trying to raise is that in our long-term plan, activity management plan, we, had, we, did have, we did have time frames that we were supposed to meet or we're going to work towards. So there may have been a submission from ECAN, but when I read the activity management plans, they, they weren't changed. So. And it was broken down in three stages. And yeah, so I, I just I, wanted to see. What, I actually we're think that for an there's an oversight in terms of the way that we did the long-term plan process, right. and that is, is that we sat there and listened to um, ECAN. They said, "Don't proceed with the um, your natural hazards um, strategy separate from our process." Yeah. We agreed with that process. Um, and we had a, quite a good discussion about it, as I recall. ECAN came and made the submission, but we also no met with them beforehand to make sure that this was all, so all I was dealt asking, with. And what we didn't do is go back and amend the activity management yeah. plan. So, so let's, let's, let's deal with it that right. way. So just in terms of asking for an extension for submissions, which I support, strongly support, and that's, thank you for doing that, I was just trying to see whether that natural hazard strategy, whether there was any way in which that work could happen at the same time. No. So it could inform the district. It plan. would be ideal that it could, but it can't. And the reason is, is that it's an all-hazard strategy. We already have stage one of the natural hazards um, chapter of our district plan already signed and sealed by the independent hearings panel. And they have accepted the one metre sea level rise 
over 100 years. If you, I don't know if you've read the, the decision of the independent hearings panel on stage one, because if you haven't, I'm happy to send it to you, but they have accepted the one metre sea level rise. That isn't, that isn't the issue now. The issue is around, in my view, the erosion lines and whether on an accreting beach you can assume a crossover point at which it becomes an eroding beach. I think that's going to be the issue. There will be a debate around the, um, where the lines sit in relation to the, um, to the uh, inside, or the estuary side, but I think that the issues on the estuary side are far more, um, you know, that far less open to, um, to, to, to those, um, those sort of kind of disputes. And people will be able to lodge submissions, and maybe I could make this point. People can lodge submissions saying they disagree with the, um, the proposal that we've put forward, and they can say that they disagree that the accreting beach becomes an eroding beach, and they can say that they disagree that their properties are included within the line of either of the lines in terms of um, <coughs> erosion one or two, the 50-year or the 100-year line. They can argue all of those and they can say, and I disagree with the science. But they don't have to produce the report that backs that up um, until they get to the hearing. So, you know, even if we don't get agreement from central government about extending the time. I would like to extend the time so we could spend more time talking to the community about what the plan actually proposes and why we're doing it and what the, the report is that we're basing our best advice on and also telling them what they can argue in the meantime. But they don't, if the government says no, it all has to be in by next Friday, Friday week, 4th of September. Um, it's an interesting date there for a lot of reasons. Um, but if, the, if they have to be in by the 4th of September, people can put a submission in and say they disagree with the science. All of the information can be provided at a later date and people can collectivise, and I have recommended this to people myself, join forces, hire, you know, geotechnical engineers of your own, hire a scientist who can provide some information to back up an alternative position. There is a debate to be had about where, when, how and why. That's the, that is the challenge of climate change, and it is the challenge of an eroding beach um, beach line or an eroding coastline when in fact at the moment it's an accreting coastline and all of the assumptions that are based on it, you can only base these things on assumptions. But anyway, somebody here, Tim and then Paul. I mean, you kind of said it anyway. I mean, I think there's a bit of confusion about people thinking they need to get the submissions in and have all their supporting data and arguments at that time. They actually don't. They can put their submission in and then have an however long it is between the, the closing date of the submissions and when the hearing is going to be held to get their supporting evidence. And as um, Leanne said, you know, if they can join forces to hire experts or get expert evidence, they do have a bit more time. But I think that's where the confusion was. The bigger issue, though, is it's all very well to say to the community, you know, you've got this time frame of one month, but if they don't know what's actually happening and they don't understand it, then this will go past and they won't have an opportunity. So it's really our job to get out there and inform them properly because most of them don't know what's actually happening and, and, and they have been given confusing information around this, this particular topic. And they're only just finding out now, like with less than a couple of weeks to go before they have to get the submission in, on what's actually going to happen to their property. Insurability, value, is, you know, they don't understand how it's going to affect their property and, and the future of it, so that's something that we need but to do. The value of my property hasn't changed an inch, not a bit, even though I got one of those letters. And the thing is, is that value and insurability have got nothing to do with lines on maps. We they have got Leanne, everything in, in, to in do respect, with what people the... judge to be the risk and whether people judge to the wonderful beach environment to live in 
with lines on maps have never changed the value. If at all due respect, we got told, and we only found out at the uh, briefing we gave to the community, that some properties will not be able to actually uh, redevelop uh, past what they're currently developed on. So if you had a, a piece of land with a shack on it, you can't build anything. What do you bigger, mean you in? only found that out at the? We thing? only found that out. No, sorry, that was the whole basis for the coastal zone one. Zone one, you only can redevelop um, to, to the footprint that you have now. That's what zone one does. The community didn't understand it. No, I know, but you obviously didn't understand it, but you were at the meeting that decided it. It's not, compli it's not complying, but it's not prohibited. You can still apply for it. Yeah. I just suggest that, um, and I don't know if we've done this, but could we put a presentation on our website? We did. We, we, ha we had it there? live streamed. Yes, but it's, could we have one sitting there now? Because this is it um, is there. It is there. Yes. So if people we, go, to we deliberately the... live streamed the presentation so that people could go to it and link to it. Great. And I mean, I went away and linked to it yep. on my Facebook page. I assume that everyone else did. And so that's still there. I haven't checked. So that is good for people to know because, as Paul's saying, it's people still are struggling to, to get that information. Yeah. And I mean, you know, we, we know where to find it, but a lot of times people. But you're quite don't. right. Look, I think that if we could have a little bit more time just to ex take the heat out of it, because actually, once people understand that it is not a prohibition on development. It is not a, you know, sort of secret retreat, you know, option that we're, we're imposing on people. Um, that what it is, is that it is the science that has been utilised by the council, the, you know, which is the best available to us, to um, put forward a proposal for the coastal erosion and coastal inundation lines. I mean, the interesting thing is, is why it took four years for us to put a flood management area in. I mean, why did it? Because people went off to court um, and fought it over and over again. But at the end of the day, the council had to operationalise the areas that were exposed to flood risk. And we did. And guess what? Nobody's property values went down because we put in a flood management area between two earthquakes. And in fact, I mean, in many respects, the, 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 the risk that we would be facing as a city in terms of flood risk, um, you know, despite the unlawful nature of the residential red zone, if the Crown hadn't done that, we would be dealing with thousands of properties that would have protection. been exposed to yeah. way more flood yeah. risk than they were before yeah. the earthquakes. So in a way we, we'd be remiss not to give this information out to people. We so, have to we have you know, to give it out. Yeah. The, 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 problem, the problem is the timing, the problem is the um, lack of opportunity to educate people, and as Paul and Yanni have highlighted, the inaccuracy of information Telling people they can't do something when it's a not, it's a non-permitted activity, and you know you, you do have to be sitting on a council sometimes to understand that a, a non-permitted or non-complying activity is not a prohibited activity. You you just have to apply for a consent to do it, and what the council will be looking for is is what have you done to mitigate against it. So. And that, and that, I mean, it will lead to changes in the way we develop in these areas. You know, people will put in houses that are basically able to be moved. You know, people will put in, um, uh, you know, different methods for, um, uh, for infrastructure support, you know, because of the risks of the vulnerability of that environment for putting in, you know, hard, hardwired infrastructure. I mean, I think the um, pressure sewer systems are down um, Rocking Horse Road, and you know, and I mean, the, I've had hugely positive feedback from um, communities there because they feel less exposed to risk than they did do with hardwired infrastructure that took a long time or would have taken much longer to repair. 
but it is around those speeds. I mean, these people, this is getting rushed through at a time, you know, where these people don't quite understand. The pressure... Uh, yeah, but don't, don't use the actually, word rushed through. It is. As I say... The only thing that's rushed is the 30 working days, that's the legal time frame for making a submission. They don't have to produce the evidence when they make the submission. There, they, is, there are months, and we will don't continue understand, with though, our... They're only just starting to come to understand what it means, the, these various no, no, but, overlays but that come on their property. This is live stream, so hopefully they'll get it. Yeah, what, the, the question about what it means, though, you know, there are properties down South Shore that don't have insurance for flood now. You know, and actually they haven't for years. But those people self-insure, and this is the thing that bothers me, is that unless we keep working with the insurance industry, they'll make those decisions for people. And I'd much rather that the council work collaboratively with the insurance industry so they still have access to insurance. And by taking mitigation um, approach uh, to, to, to um, hazards that we face, um, then we can keep that relationship going. And that's a good thing. But, you know, people who, who've got houses on the beach, um, you know, um, uh, you, you look at, you look at um, all around New York where, um, you know, uh, Hurricane Sandy hit, you know, there, there, there have been places that haven't had insurance for years and years and years. The value is retained. The houses just keep getting built back. So, and that's not what we want to do in Christchurch. We want to support people um, in, in the environment that they're in. But we don't want to intensify development in areas where we know that there's going to be future risk. Just we support you on the extension, but it, it's... Um, even just producing the submission in that time frame is enough for people. So I think, notwithstanding trying to come up with any evidence, so um, even that's causing a lot of <coughs> upset. But just to lodge a submission saying, I, I don't agree with it. I know. But yeah. even that in, in itself is yeah. Um, yeah, tough to... Oh, um, we'll deal with this issue first. So, David... And yeah, I, I was just going to support the, um, the move to extend the the uh, period for submissions and, and it is quite evident that um, <clears throat> it's imperative to actually get a submission in uh, in some form or other <clears throat> in this this space um, I think my opinions on this subject are well aired but um, I, I do still have a concern about um, the coastal frontage and it for me it comes back to property value and whether uh, whether or not we are keen to actually promote anything there, and I think you know if this if the property values were a hell of a lot higher than they are, we probably wouldn't be attacking them this situation as as we are now. Um, parts of Merivale were and Fendleton were rebuilt because the value was high and they wouldn't didn't want to rezone red zone them. So I think we do have an, an attitude issue with the uh, eastern suburbs in that, and it, this has unfortunately come from staff at times, that the value of the properties don't warrant us uh, investing in the area. So I think there is a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of attitude problems. There's a lot of uh, misconception, and uh, I'm very keen to see that the, the uh, implications of the coastal hazard zones and flood management areas are properly understood. And I don't believe they are at the moment. And uh, we've got a fair amount of work and a large group of people out there now that are feeling uh, quite aggrieved. In some instances, I think it's well-founded. In others, it's, it's probably a lack of understanding of, of the situation. But uh, we've got a huge problem on our hands looming. Yeah, well, look, um, I'll just, I don't want to add to the confusion, though. The residential red zone decision was about the value of the properties. It was. Because what the, what the Crown was looking for was, first of all, the I don't know if you remember them talking about it, but the crust. It's the height of the water table. That's the issue. And, of course, liquefaction risk it isn't just about the, the type of soil, it's about the, 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 
the height of the water table. So if you've got a, a thin crust between the, what's the water table to the surface where your house is, um, then that obviously uh, is going to take a different approach to um, you know, um, the type of house that can be really built in those areas. And that wasn't taken into account. You know, I mean, I just remember going to that first meeting at Pacific, um, well, uh, um, in Bexley after the September earthquake, where all the older people said, we said they should never build Pacific Park. You know, I mean, they knew. They knew about it. So we had unreinforced concrete slab foundations built on the edge of a wetland susceptible to liquefaction and lateral spread. I mean, it's just diabolical. But the government, when it made the decision, it said, how much would it cost to, to, to knock everything down, tear up the infrastructure, basically re prepare the land again and rebuild, and what's the value of the sections at the end of the process? That's why they use the 2007 rating valuations. I would recommend that you read the cabinet paper that made the decisions on the residential red zone, because it is true that the value of the land actually <coughs> made it more cost effective to buy people out than it did to repair and rebuild the whole lot. So, you know, it, it, it was a decision that was based on the value, but that was not a council decision. That was a Crown decision, and it is something that, on one hand, we've dealt with a person today who's, you know, stuck in a, you know, in a position not of his making. Um, and on the other hand, we as a city would be dealing with thousands more properties that were exposed to far greater flood risk than they ever were if the government hadn't intervened. That's the truth of it. Yeah, then you talk about the crust and things. And, I mean, look, I live a block away from the beach. And in all the earthquakes, we've had no liquefaction whatsoever, and we've just got a mountain No, no, it's, sand. it's soil and crust. Well, we've, we've it's soil sand. types. Yeah, but sand doesn't liquefy. Well, no. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole of that coastline strip, including South Shore, apart from the estuary frontage... But all we've, all we've proved is that there are a lot of issues that people don't understand, and actually we're some of the people that don't understand mm. all of the issues well, I agree. as well. And I think it's been... It hasn't been... Um, greatly um, elucidated to our communities some of the technicalities and I think uh, we're just heading for a wee bit of a turmoil. Yeah, but we, we are in a legal process that requires us to ask the government to assist us in this regard. Madam Grant, Mayor, I see two Grant other hands going. <coughs> can we just receive this report? And maybe in future, can we have decision papers at the start of the agenda? Because this is interesting, but I kind of feel it's not the place for it. Yeah. And we're just spending a whole lot of valuable time, and we won't make a decision before that. Yeah, no, I'm right. sorry. Yeah, that's my fault. Um, Phil? Look, mine was a different point uh, area, and just a quick point, that and on page 46, at Carleen, or Carleen's report, there's reference to the processes for the unicycle route and the involvement of the... Uh, the joint was a joint committee meeting with the uh, three community boards. And I just want to compliment the, the council, Carleen, on how that process has worked. And it's a very good example of when the community boards are involved early on and make recommendations around a metropolitan issue like a net cycle work network. And in fact, this part is working very well. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So can someone move that the report be received? It's just around um, uh, construction and rebuild. Uh, right across the city, there's a lot more construction going on, as we know. Uh, but it's actually the, um, the rubbish that comes off those construction sites. Obviously, you know, in a, uh, and not in such a, uh, an environment we're working in at the moment, that's not such a problem. But when you've got so much construction and a lot more debris blowing around, we need to have a bit more control around some of those construction sites to make sure they contain their rubbish. Right. So, um, look, uh, I mean, I th I'm going to take Jamie's point. So, Jamie, you want to move that it be received. J Jimmy, you want to second yeah, that? I have, I have to move, but I have one question. One question, yeah. quick. Thank you. I'm um, question on page 50 regarding to the grade for Christchurch, Church, particular for the model of customer community and the operating model. This one, my understanding, that's where we go, you know, try to assess all the process, <coughs> technology use, people, 
time tax and also the performance cost. That's a fantastic. But I just want to know whether we have any plan regarding assessment seeking the international accreditation, like the ISO 9000 series or, or 9 ISO, ISO the, uh, the 14000 series. This international standard is my question. Um, not at this point. So our process really has been to use uh, different um, well-known techniques such as Lean um, and Six Sigma, um, and in terms of embedding those tools within the organisation so that people can then start to look at um, their own areas and the areas that they may improve. Uh, so just become part of our everyday business. Um, at some later stage, you could look at uh, using something like ISO 9000. Um, but uh, at, at this point, it's at, we're really at an early stage of improving our processes, our efficiencies, uh, and, and improving our um, customer journey and experience to, 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 so that there's much more consistency in the experience that people receive. Thank you. All right, I'm going to put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Um, next item, I want to... Um, uh, I want to take a morning break. Not, I just want to deal with this. So 